Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is a very special event you've all joined us for at the Liberty Theater. We are welcoming Jericho Brown, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, to Astoria. This was a vision initiated by the founder of the Writers Guild of Astoria, Marianne Monson, and over And over the past two years, she and the board of the Writers Guild have worked very diligently to make this happen. And now you all are here to bring it to fruition. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. I want to. <laughs> My name is Heather Hershey, and I'm a member of the board. And I want to thank the other members of the board, of course, Mary Ann and Lauren Mallett, who you will meet tonight. Sam, oh sorry, Sam, Sam Blair, yes, Flax Glore and Michael Murdoch, as well as Jennifer Nightingale. Yeah! <laughs> and our beloved treasurer, Meg, who is here from Texas tonight. <laughs> so I also want to thank um, Two former members, Sean Deal and Lynn Marie Diacani, who also contributed to tonight's event. We are very grateful to Clatsop County Coalition for the development grant that helped fund tonight. Generous, generous contributions from our many partners, including the Q Center, Dinah Urell and Hip Fish Monthly, the Elliott Hotel, and KMUN, our local radio station, and KMUN is broadcasting tonight's event as well. There will be video available after the event that we can thank KMUN for as well. Okay, um, we also want to thank the Heritage Museum for hosting the Oregon Black Pioneer exhibit currently running through November about race-based exclusionary practices, especially redlining. So please check that out. Um, we are very grateful to Vintage Hardware, Costco and Warrington, Bridgewater Bistro for contributing to our goodies tonight. And finally, we want to thank all of you. Uh, Astoria Writers Guild is a um, member-based organization, so our members have made this happen, and we hope that if you're interested in continuing to be a part, if you're not already a member, that you'll check us out at www.thewritersguild.org. And I am going to now introduce Lauren Mallett, who oversaw the amazing poetry contest we have as a corollary event to Jericho's reading. After Jericho's poem, Tra The Tradition, contestants were asked to write their own pieces, and then we selected winners. We have three winners tonight, and Lauren will tell you more about that special event, and you'll get to hear from the winners. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Writers Guild Board of Directors, I'd like to thank all of the writers who submitted poems to our poetry contest. Your poetry astounded us. Special thanks to Susan Banyas for her vocal instruction. To, oh, yes. Thank you. There you are. <laughs> Two of our three contest winners will be sharing their poems tonight. Our third winner, Astoria High School senior Rocky Rube, is the quarterback of the football team. And he's currently on the field in a playoff game. Yeah. 
In this week's issue of Coast Weekend, Rube said, I don't know why, but I always had this imagery of po or image of poetry being old fashioned. French men in dim cafes with cigarettes and weird hats. <laughs> I didn't know how modern and universal poetry could be. Once I understood that, I started writing with intent. A recording of his winning poem, Traditions, Curses, will be uploaded soon to the writersguild.org. Elisa Carlson grew up in Humboldt County, Nevada. She is a poet, artist, and rusted metal fanatic. She currently lives in Oregon on nearly three acres of rain. <laughs> <laughs> She recently completed her first chapbook, Cormorant, a collection of poems structured by the life history stages of the double-crested cormorant and phrases from the wildlife management plan she spent years of her life working on. Cormorant is under contract with Unsolicited Press of Portland. Elisa is currently working on a collection of poems about Nevada. This is the second contest she has ever won. The first was a bike race when she was 10. <laughs> and that bike race was on a baby blue BMX. <laughs> Emily Ransdell is a part-time resident of Manzanita where she teaches poetry workshops and helps organize various writing events at Hoffman Center for the Arts. Her work has appeared in Poetry Northwest, Poet Lore, Tar River Poetry, Terrain, River Sticks, and elsewhere. She has been a, vi a finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize, the New Millennium Writings Award, and runner-up for the New Letters Poetry Prize. Emily was twice selected by Ted Kuzer to appear in American Life in Poetry. And now we'll hear from our poet winners. Trailers. Walk to the back door. Aluminum, powder-coated, hollow. Open it and look outside, down to the leftovers, corrugated fields, and fixers. Up to a backyard of stars and velveteen range, and colors that call you home and hold you to this basin like you never had a chance. I swear, every time I leave will be the last. I get as far as the rain, Sometimes. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by saying thank you. It's so exciting to be here. And now for the rest of my life, I get to say I was the warm-up act for Jericho Brown. <laughs> By way of introduction, my mother calls me Petunia, though hers never bloom. I am part empty flower pot, part lead paint. She is thumbed through, a magazine of do-it-yourself projects left unfinished, a cotton house dress worn unhemmed. She drinks Jack Daniels from a juice glass ashtray on her knees, lawn chair under backyard peach trees in the swelter of August nights. That's where she was when her water broke. Four weeks early, drunken bees careening, all the peaches left unpicked. I should have named you Alberta, she says. All my life, I had to hear that. Sometimes she called me Sweetie Pie. 
says you can tell a lot about a person by the kind of pie they like. Take you, she said one night, a little juiced. You're the blackberry type. Your perfume alone is praise. You're what I'd say if I prayed. Thank you. Today I had the great privilege of being in a workshop with Jericho Brown at Clatsop Community College where he talked about, asked us to return to our six-year-old selves. Apparently that was about the age that Jericho Brown started writing poetry. He says he was writing as, he was writing poetry as soon as he could write. He grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana where he fell in love with poetry at the local library. Librarians there would give him books by poets like Rita Dove. And when Rita Dove won the 1986 Pulitzer Prize, her poster was hung around Jericho School. He decided in seeing that poster that that's what he was going to do. And in 2020, Jericho won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry for his collection, The Tradition. The tradition also was nominated for the um, National Book Award in 2019. Jericho's first book of poetry, Please, was published in 2009 and won the American Book Award. The New Testament, his second book, won a uh, Field Wolf Book Award. I'm sorry, it was the National Book Award. He also, in 2019, he also has been a recipient of the Guggenheim and a National Endowment for the Arts. He is the associate professor, uh, he is an associate professor of English at Emory College, English and Creative Writing, and he directs the creative writing program there at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Jericho Brown's poetry touches on the weird intersection of violence and love, the being of humans. And what really struck me today that he left us with was that he finds poetry to be the place where we may be able, where he feels like he's writing the utterance of the divine Please join me in welcoming poet Jericho Brown. Did y'all get to pay less to sit up there? <laughs> Those are like the safe seats. Y'all know y'all never get no COVID up there, right? <laughs> you know COVID don't rise high, honey. It stay low. <laughs> uh, thank y'all so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to forget somebody because everyone here has been so kind. I am really grateful to the Writers Guild. I think we should give a very special hand to Marianne for all that she has brought to Astoria and to Oregon in general. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, thank, thank you to Jennifer for that introduction and for um, just traveling around with me all, all weekend. Uh, thank you to Heather for that introduction. Thank you to Jennifer for traveling around with me all weekend. She followed me around with a chicken salad sandwich all night. <laughs> and made sure that I got it and ate it. Thank you, Lauren, for bringing me a Coca-Cola and not a Diet Coke. Um, 
Um, really big thanks to the community college here and to the radio station, uh, obviously. And um, I have to say, my biggest piece of gratitude right now goes to Regina at Posey Reed, um, who I have to thank for all the clothes I'm wearing. She's responsible for my drag. Um, thank you, Regina. She, uh, she told me she, she couldn't be here, but I wish y'all could have. The best, better than the poetry was me trying to figure out how to make an outfit happen for tonight. I looked in my suitcase and I realized, oh, I don't have anything I was supposed to bring. So I, um, I'm not so good at traveling after not having traveled for 16 months. Um, and, my, um, and while I was there, she and her daughter, her daughter uh, is autistic, and I would pick up a tie and she would say, mm. <laughs> and I knew, I knew that was not the tie, you know. And then um, she would make a different sound, and I'm like, is everything okay? And Regina told me, she says, that means I'm excited. So I was holding this tie. That means she's excited, so I was holding this tie, so I figured it must be the right tie. So I'm really happy to actually have something to wear. You know. Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate that. I was really worried, but it worked out. I'm grateful. <laughs> um, so you know, if y'all need anything to wear, go to go to Posey Reed. I'm going to. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and big big thanks to to Meg, to Andrew, to everybody with the Writers Guild and everybody in the city who's been so kind. People have been, um, you know, I walk from one place to another, and people come up to me and they say, "I'm going to come tonight," or "I'm going to come tomorrow." When I was here yesterday, and I really appreciate all of the love and the support. And uh, it's really nice to know that poetry cannot be pinned down by location, that it is indeed everywhere, uh, and that my poems move forward without me whether or not I move forward. I'm grateful for that, and that is exactly what I wanted when I was a kid dreaming of becoming a poet. So I'm gonna read some of those poems to you. Is that okay if I read you some poems? <laughs> so where I'm from, we always begin with prayer, so. Prayer of the backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek, make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand, hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising, father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. This next poem is named after a phrase uh, that's very popular where I'm from. I'm from Louisiana, and I've actually never heard anyone use this phrase other than uh, in the state of Louisiana, or I hear it from people in other places who are from Louisiana. Uh, if you don't know the phrase, I think its meaning will become clear to you as I'm reading the poem. Four day in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. 
She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Bloom. I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 4 day in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house? A boy to keep the lawn cut? Some color in the yard? My God, we leave things green. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read 45 poems. If y'all want to clap after every one of them, I'm just fine. Um, <laughs> Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating, and learned to cuss cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damn difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been. They're all dead now dead and in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, you want to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hate it and say, I once had something to do with my hands. <clears throat> uh, this next poem has a, a little bit of the Odyssey um, alluded in it. And uh, I also think the poem owes a debt to a, a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks called Gay Chaps at the Bar. Uh, which if you don't know, I hope you'll read. Um, if you do know the poem, you'll, you'll, see, why, uh, you'll see why I'm referencing that. I think, I think that the reference to the Odyssey will be pretty obvious. <clears throat> Hero. She never knew one of us from another, so my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black, black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. 
Thank God it can't get much darker than that. I often uh, get asked about process and how I go about making poems, and uh, that answer is very difficult for me to give. Actually, I'm pretty good at giving the answer. It just takes a really long time <laughs> because, because every poem arrives in a different way. Uh, this poem in particular is, um, is interesting to me at least because there's not one original line in it which is actually very funny because I would get angry with my students about that. Uh, but it's a poem where I have taken phrases that I heard uh, in the church, in the school, in the neighborhood where I grew up, and I put all of those phrases together in this poem. So this poem is sort of an amalgamation of, uh, of what I heard and what I understood life to be like when I was growing up. Autobiography. Keep the line steady, keep your back straight, keep coming back for more, keep fucking with me, Cletus, keep putting your hands on me like that, and you'll always have a place to lay your head. Keep my waistline down, keep your figure up, keep your man happy, keep a woman crazy, Keep your daddy off your mama or next time I'm calling the police. Keep these nappy-headed children off my green, green grass. Keep talking smart if you want to. Keep looking at my man and I'll cut you a new eyelid. Keep looking me in my face when you tell your next lie. Keep on walking, I ain't talking to you anymore. Keep holding that last note. Keep singing while I get the splinter out. Keep singing for Jesus, baby, and everything will be all right. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Keep your eyes on the black one. He ain't got no sense. Keep your money in your pocket, Nelson. These hoes giving it away. Keep this one occupied. I'll get his wallet. Keep on living, honey, and you'll get old too. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital where she will settle next to him forever as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing. And it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won marred him. He'll have a scar he can see all because of you and your mother, the only woman you ever cried for, must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury, no matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you. So um, I think it was mentioned, I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, and I left there and I lived for a good, a good little while in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. I left there uh, to go to school to get my PhD in Houston, Texas. And when I left there, I moved to San Diego, California, which is where I found out that I have an accent. Um, <laughs> I had no idea before that. Um, I also found out that there were um, many words and many phrases that were particular to the South 
even more particular to Louisiana that I used all the time. And people simply did not know those words or phrases and didn't, often didn't understand what I was saying. One such word is the word nim. Uh, and uh, it is a word that has a meaning. Uh, it means that person and everyone you associate with that person. Uh, to put it in context for you, say you went to high school with somebody and when you knew them in school, you knew them and their family pretty well. Uh, and you might have known not just their family, but their extended family if you hung out with them tight enough. Um, uh, you don't see them for a long time. And when you see them again, if you live uh, where I am from, you might say to them, hey, how you doing? How is your mama them? That's how that word works. And now, they said to say good night and not goodbye unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses, so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves, even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived, that one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came, people like me forgot their names. So I'm going to read some poems to you that are uh, in many ways about my own personal nim. Um, for this first one, uh, you may want to know that Janis Joplin recorded the Gershwin Standard Summertime with Big Brother and the Holding Company for their 1968 chart-topping album, Cheap Thrills. She died of a heroin overdose in 1970. She was, uh, she was 27 years old. Track five, Summertime, as performed by Janis Joplin. God's got his eye on me, but I ain't a sparrow. I'm more like a lawnmower. No, a chainsaw. Anything that might mangle each manicured lawn in Port Arthur, a place I wouldn't return to if the mayor offered me every ounce of oil my daddy cans at the refinery. My voice, I mean, ain't sweet. Nothing nice about it. It won't fly, even with Jesus watching. I don't believe in Jesus. The Baxter boys climbed a tree just to throw persimmons at me. The good and perfect gifts from above hit like lightning, leave bruises. So I lied, I believe, but I don't think God likes me. The girls in the locker room slapped dirty pads across my face. They called me bitch, but I never bit back. I ain't a dog. Chainsaw, I say. My voice hacks at you. I bet I tear my throat. I try so hard to sound jagged. I get high and say one thing so many times, like Willie Baker, who worked across the street. I saw some kids whip him with a belt while he repeated, please. School out, summertime, and the living lashed. Mama said I should be thankful that the town's worse to coloreds than they are to me, that I'd grow out of my acne. God must love Willie Baker. All that leather and still a please that sounds like music. See, I wouldn't know a sparrow from a mockingbird. The band plays, I just belt out, please. This tune ain't half the blues. I should be thankful I get high and moan like a lawnmower so nobody notices. I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. I try to sing like a man. Boys call, boy. I turn my face to God. 
I pray, I wish I could pour oil on everything green in Port Arthur. And this poem makes use of the myth of Ganymede, the Greek myth of Ganymede. Uh, and if you don't know that myth, I think the poem, um, the poem will say enough for you to begin to come to know it. Ganymede is definitely one of my name. <laughs> Ganymede. A man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like the safety of it. No one at fault, everyone rewarded. God gets the boy. The boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying, rape, I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven, that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. Say thank you, say I'm sorry. I don't know whose side you're on, but I am here for the people who work in grocery stores that glow in the morning and close down for deep cleaning at night. Right up the street and in cities I mispronounce, in towns too tiny for my big black car to quit, and in every wide corner of Kansas where going to school means at least one field trip to a slaughterhouse. I want so little. Another leather-bound book, a gimlet with a lavender gin, bread so good when I taste it, I can tell you how it's made. I'd like us to rethink what it is to be a nation. I'm in a mood about America today. I have PTSD about the Lord. God save the people who work in grocery stores. They know a bit of glamour is a lot of glamour. They know how much it costs for the eldest of us to eat. Save my loves and not my sentences. Before I see them, I draw a mole near my left dimple, add flair to the smile they can't see behind my mask. I grin or lie, or maybe I wear the mouth of a beast. I eat wild animals while some of us grow up knowing what gnocchi is. The people who work at the grocery don't care. They say, thank you. They say, sorry, we don't sell motor oil anymore. With a grief so thick, you could touch it. Go on, touch it. It is early. It is late. They have washed their hands. They have washed their hands for you. And they take the bus home. I wrote this next poem after finding out about and being confounded by the very long list of people who have supposedly committed suicide while in police custody. That list includes people like Jesus Huerta in North Carolina, who after having been patted down, while handcuffed, on the walk from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be booked, somehow managed to shoot himself in the back corner of his head. Or Victor White the Third in Louisiana, where I'm from, who, after having been patted down while handcuffed, sitting in the back seat of a police cruiser, somehow managed to shoot himself in his upper back. Or Sandra Bland in Texas, who, after a day of fighting for her life, 
hung herself with a trash bag uh, in a cell where there is footage, for, footage of her. Uh, something happens uh, with that video feed, with that uh, stream, and there's technical difficulty. And according to the coroner, the video stream goes out at just the moment that Sandra Bland must have hung herself with that trash bag. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head, and I will not shoot myself in the back, and I will not hang myself with a trash bag, and if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do, I promise you cigarette smoke, or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. <laughs> Crossing. The water is one thing, and one thing for miles. The water is one thing making this bridge built over the water another. Walk it early. Walk it back when the day goes dim, everyone rising just to find a way toward rest again. We work. Start on one side of the day like a planet's only sun, our eyes straight until the flame sinks. The flame sinks. Thank God I'm different. I figured and counted. I'm not crossing to cross back. I'm set on something vast. It reaches long as the sea. I'm more than a conqueror, bigger than bravery. I don't march. I'm the one who leaps. Thank you. Uh, I'm, reading, I'm reading retrospectively for you, which is to say I'm reading uh, from my first book, Please. I'm reading to you from my second book, uh, The New Testament. My mother is still angry with me about that title. Uh, and I'm also reading to you from my most recent book, uh, The Tradition. Uh, one of the features of The Tradition is a form I invented called the duplex. Uh, the duplex is at once a huzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. And I'm going to read uh, one of those for you now. And I think if you know those forms at all, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear them come through in this reading. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there.
And, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to finish with some love poems. Can I read you some love poems? <laughs> you know you have to ask for consent. Uh, hmm. uh, before I, I read this next poem, you may want to know that Billy Strayhorn wrote Lush Life while he was still a teenager. Um, Lush Life is one of my favorite songs in the whole wide world, and I, uh, obviously Nat King Cole has a great, a great version of, of Lush Life, but my favorite is Natalie Cole's. And I love to hear so many artists uh, attempt to sing it. Um, even Queen Latifah has a very fine version of, of Lush Life. Um, every time I think about Billy Strayhorn writing a song like Lush Life, a song that difficult and complex, I really hate Billy Strayhorn. Um, I mean, and how do you write something? He was like 17 or 18 when he wrote it. I could kill the guy. <laughs> Track one, Lush Life. The woman with the microphone sings to hurt you, to see you shake your head. The mic may as well be a leather belt. You drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. A lover's tongue might call you bitch, a term of endearment where you come from, a kind of compliment preceded by the word sing in certain nightclubs. A lush little tongue you have, you can yell, sang, bitch, and I love you with a shot of Patron at the end of each phrase from the same bar stool every Saturday night. But you can't remember your father's leather belt without shaking your head. That's what satisfies her, the woman with the microphone. She does not mean to entertain you, and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue. Call me your bitch, and I'll sing the whole night long. Y'all said I could read love poems. <laughs> Heart condition. I don't want to hurt a man, but I like to hear one big. Two people touch twice a month in ten hotels, and we call it long distance. He holds down one coast, I wander the other like any African-American. Africa with its condition, and America with its condition, and black folk born in this nation content to carry half of each. I shoulder my share. My man flies to touch me, sky on our side, sky, sky above his world I wish to write, which is where I go wrong. Words are a sense of sound. I get smart. My mother shakes her head. My grandmother sighs. He ain't got no sense. My grandmother is dead. She lives with me. I hear my mother shake her head over the phone. Somebody cut the cord. We have a long distance relationship. I lost half of her to a stroke. God gives to each a body. God gives every body its pains. When pain mounts in my body, I try thinking of my white forefathers who hurt their black bastards quite legally. I hate to say it, but one pain can ease another. Doctors, rather, I take pills. My man wants me to see a doctor. What are you when you leave your man wanting? What am I now that I think so fondly of airplanes? What's my name? Whose is it while we make love? My lover leaves me with words I wish to write, flies from one side of a nation to the outside of our world. I don't want the world. I only want African sense of American sound. 
him touching this body aware of its pains. Greetings, earthlings, my name is slow and stumbling. I come from planet trouble. I am here to love you, uncomfortable. I love poem. I love poetry, um, and I think I love poetry more than anything. I love poetry. I mean, I hope that's clear. I love poetry. Uh, I hope I love poetry so much. Uh, the only thing that I love more than poetry is cuddling. Uh, I just think cuddling wins all day long. I can't believe y'all are here. Uh, you should be cuddling. Um, you know, go home and cuddle. Uh, you know, afterward. This is a poem about cuddling. Stand. Peace on this planet, or guns glowing hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden, or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching, or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything, the cushion of it, the skin and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love, somebody killed, somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. Um, I'm gonna read one more poem, but before I do, I just wanna uh, say congratulations and thank you to the winners of that contest. Weren't they absolutely wonderful? We should give them a hand. Uh, I'm gonna finish with the poem that's, also, that's the last poem in my book. Uh, it's also in my most recent book. Uh, it's also uh, the last duplex in the book. Um, I mentioned to you before that a duplex is at once a puzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. This particular duplex adds yet another layer of form, um, because I'm a nerd. Uh, it is also a cento. Um, as, as you know, a cento is a poem that takes all of its lines from other poems, usually by other poets. This cento is a little different, as, as it is completely made up of all of the lines of the other duplexes in the book. <clears throat> oh. And uh, I, had to, I had to tell y'all that because that means you're gonna hear a line I already read in the other, in, you know? So I don't want you to think I just ran out of ideas. <laughs> and, and I had to tell you that I was reading the last poem because you know, there's all this conversation about what the superior genre is, but you know, fiction writers cannot read you the last page of their book. <laughs> Duplex, Cento. My last love drove a burgundy car. Color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road, our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse. But I didn't want to leave a messy corpse obliterated in some lilied field, stench obliterating lilies of the field, the murderer young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father. Steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. Thank you so much.
take a 10 minute in intermission and then please return. Marianne will be interviewing Jericho on stage. So, we, you, we, and we will be entertaining some of the questions that the audience wrote beforehand. So, thank you. So, welcome back to the second half 